You are listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, where we believe the Bible is sufficient and answers life's problems. I'm your host, Pastor Jeff Christensen. This podcast is for everyone in the body of Christ, staff pastor, church leader, caring homemaker, the responsible businessman, everybody. But it's also for my Calvary Chapel University students. Shout out, hello to you guys. All of us are called to offer counsel regularly. And we every day need a word of counsel from the Lord. So these episodes are designed to assist you in learning to give godly counsel. Also to develop discernment in evaluating counsel that you receive. So it's my prayer that these podcasts, that these episodes will enlarge your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a wonderful counselor. God bless you. Grab your Bibles. Let's get started. See you on the inside. Hey there, welcome back to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, hashtag self-counsel. So if you want to put any quotes on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, hashtag hashtag self-counsel. So in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Before you can counsel somebody else about their trial, you have to have a good theology and the ability to self-counsel. You know what I mean? Walk in God's counsel for your own edification, for your own maturity, for your own, um, you know, growth. And and have you ever gone through a trial and thought, you know, this is the most, this is the strangest thing, or this is absolutely. Um, this has no rhyme or reason to it. it. It's pointless. There's no way I'm going to get out of this. And so the struggling, the uncomfortability, the inaccuracy, the pain uh, that it goes through, these things are common, according to Peter. Do not think it's strange. And so when people come to you and you're ready to disciple them and bring counsel to them and they come to you for counsel and they say, the strangest thing has happened to me, Take them to this verse, 1 Peter 4, 12. And when they are shocked, or you're shocked, I'm shocked about the things that happen in our lives, we, yeah, it's understandable that this type of thing happens or that we think this way, but we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't say it's strange. When we get a fiery trial, difficulty, challenge, and possibility when it's unpleasant and it's challenging in our life, we got to come back to the scripture. And God says it's not strange, it has a purpose. It's not strange in that it's common among men. People face trials because we're in a fallen world. Now, some trials you shouldn't be dealing with as a Christian, right? First Peter 4.15 tells us about that. Don't suffer as a murderer or or assassinate people's character because we'll see that in a moment. But if it's evil or being a thief or an evildoer or a busybody, isn't it interesting? 1 Peter 4.15 puts being a busybody in the same category as a murderer and a thief and an evildoer. Don't be a busybody in other people's matters because you're just dessert what you get is if you indulge in fleshy living and if you disobey the Lord and you're doing something wrong, if you're suffering that way, you need to repent, look to Jesus for forgiveness, and then be led down that path of discipleship. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about suffering that doesn't make sense. Like, I'm walking with God. Why am I going through this trial? And it's it's just walking in the path of godliness, and I'm facing this impossibility, this trial, and it's so strange. But look at 1 Peter chapter 1. I love Peter. He's gone through trials. It's funny. Peter's gone through these trials with Jesus. If you read in the Gospels about Peter's life— and then you read 
First and Second Peter, you see all of his lessons were learned with Jesus, and then he writes uh, these epistles that are super helpful because they're based in real reality where the rubber meets the road. Peter's a practical guy, and he says this: "In this you greatly rejoice." First Peter, chapter one, verse six and seven. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And I'll say this. I'm going to pause there. You need it. I need it. I don't like it. But I'm being grieved by various trials. Oh, wow. But he says, why? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Yes, I love to rejoice when God is doing good things and life is flourishing. But when grief comes and trials come and consequences of other people's sin and a fallen world come, I don't like the discomfort. But the grief, the difficulty, the challenge is worth it because of the spiritual dividends that it produces. That's what the Bible says. These trials are not arbitrary. They have a purpose. So when they seem strange, number one, they're common to man because of the fall. And when they think they're pointless or purposeless and what good can come out of this, the Bible says they're there to prove and to test us. And all throughout life, We can be proving that our faith is genuine because when difficulties arise, we trust the Lord. We have an opportunity. Are you going to trust the flesh? Are you going to complain? Are you going to get in the, get in the striving fleshy, you know, mood and not trust the Lord because observers, unbelievers Younger believers, those that you counsel, are going to see your claim to faith is real and not just religiosity. Do you see why it's hashtag self-counsel? Because if you're not walking in victory in the midst of your trials, how are you going to help others? And, you know, I'm preaching to myself, by the way. Hello. These things are me. Because I go through these trials, it's it's funny Counsel, counsel thyself. (laughs) You know, I call friends. I've got pastor friends, leaders, elders, mature men, and even, you know, my wife is my number one counselor, actually, besides, obviously, the Lord. She's the number one instrument of God's counsel in my life. And she could really point me back to the Lord Jesus Christ. But so can other pastor friends of mine. But as I go through them, It's an opportunity to trust in the Lord. And as I learn to trust in the Lord and grow in that, I get to see God work. And I learn to depend on him. Because if I'm depending on other pastors or other people or in myself, worse yet, then I'm not depending on the Lord. So that's why I I must practice self-counsel. Turning to the Lord when trials come. And you know what happens? I'm refined because God's been faithful yesterday. He will be faithful in this trial today. And there's greater and greater purity. And it becomes a real relationship. God in this passage likens faith unto gold. You know how that goes through a refining process. If you're a metallurgist or something or you know metallurgy, gold gold ore is heated in the kiln and heated to overheating where it melts and then up bubbles worthless dross and contaminants, and you scrape it off, separate it from the precious, pure gold. Well, God does that with us in circumstantial fires, really, that the true faith might be separated from dependence on ourself and dependent dependence on others. I depend on others a lot. I really do. And I lean on myself a lot. Sad to say, I need some self-counsel today. And that's why I'm reading this to you because God is teaching me and growing me in learning to depend on the Lord when I go through trials. Sometimes I think this trial, I need answers. I need help. 
instead of running to the Lord, I pick up the phone or I send an email or I send a text message. And what I need to do is withhold that until I've spent time at the feet of Jesus and open his word. Because God takes me through fires, takes you through fires, and I want true faith in him, not to be um, faith in other people. You know, Jesus is coming again soon. He'll get the honor, the glory for anything that we've done when we trusted him. Now, if you want to turn over, let's talk about trials some more. James as good as Peter is with trials. James chapter 1, if you go there, I love both of these brothers. They're both practical, James and Peter. And James chapter 1, verse 2, uh, when people suffer God for, for being godly. And, and I think this is important, you know, that you walk in it, and then you help the people that you're counseling walk in it. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Look, you know, trials themselves not necessarily are a reason for joy, but in the midst of the trial, you can be joyful. I like to say that because I hear some people say, well, you know, that's a reason for joy. Well, my dog got hit and killed, run over by a car. That ain't a reason for joy. I'm mad. I'm mad at the driver. I'm mad at the dog. I'm mad at the world. <laughs> and I'm not joyful. But I'm, I, need to, I need to flip that around and be joyful in the midst of grief. Yes, I can cry. I can be sad. I can be ticked off. But I can also be joyful that God will work it together for good. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let your patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. We consider it a reason for joy. Doesn't mean, like I said, we, we enjoy the suffering, but we consider our trials, all of them, a matter for joy. It's an act of faith. You don't live this way by sight. You live this way by faith, the, the things that you can't see. And the difficulties of these challenges are not enjoyable in and of themselves, but that's why we've got to exercise faith. You know what? I can see what God can do. And that was what stirs rejoicing in the heart. Now, notice it doesn't say, James doesn't say, if you face trials. I know my audience. I know those that are listening to me. I read your trials. I read your troubles. Believe you me, I have mine, you have yours. In the Bible, what James says, and the Bible is clear on this, it doesn't say if they come, but when they come. So either you're facing a trial, either you just had a trial, or either you're getting ready to go into a trial. How comforting is that? Well, it's just normal part of the Christian experience. We're not to consider it strange. So once you get that settled and you begin to find victory, all you have to do is find victory once. You pass that on to the people that you counsel. Isn't that cool? Part of the reason God's going to take you through the trial is because you're going to, he's going to cross your path with that person that needs to be discipled. So the tuition isn't just what you pay out of your pocketbook with your checkbook or your credit card. It's also the trials in order to be a mature minister of the gospel. Now, sometimes they come in a variety pack. It says various trials. And sometimes they come one right after another. Other times they come all at once. And that's what's troubling Oftentimes, and that's why we need patience, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Times are hard, times are tough, but God will use that to produce patience. Have you ever heard it said, don't pray for patience, you'll get trials? Oh boy, I've prayed for patience and I've gotten trials. Maybe you have too. But when I trust in the Lord and I'm stretched and I have um, these crazy adversities and you know, these things that happen, they're totally like between a rock and a hard place. There's no way out. You know what God does? I have this stamina, a spiritual stamina. You know, I've been an athlete on and off. I'm going through a backsliding season right now where I'm not doing my exercises. Pray for me. 
pandemic threw all that off for me because I closed the gym and that's, I relied upon my coach to keep me going. And now, you know, I've gained my weight back and I can't hold my, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't breathe because I, I do mountain, uh, uh, hiking and the high altitude and things like that. Maybe you're the same way. Anyway, that's my, my deal is I need my stamina back. Well, stretching adversities brings a spiritual stamina. It brings a godly steadfastness, a Christ-like endurance. Character is so much more, you know, so much more important than physical health. You know, hey, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is what really profits. And so I want to be mature. I want to be complete. I want to be perfected experientially, I got to go through stretching uh, trials. And they test our faith. It produces endurance. So you want to be a disciple? Count the cost. And when you make disciples, you need to know this. So isn't that easy? You've got 1 Peter now, and you've got James. Take these passages walk in them, memorize them, and every time you meet somebody, you are a competent biblical counselor because you've walked in these verses, you found victory, and now you can, with strong conviction, convince others that God is available to help during trials. Do you see self-counsel is so important before you can be an effective biblical counselor? You know, when people go through a trial, what's, what do you want? You know what I want? I want relief. I want out. I want an answer. And people that come to you, that's what they're aiming at. Well, secular councils, that's what they do. Don't get caught in that trap. You know, God does deliver. God does bring relief. He's a good God, and he does that all the time. But Don't overlook a bigger work of transformation that God might want to do. Don't get in the way of God. God sometimes wants to bring sanctification. He wants to bring repentance, maybe. Maybe he wants to bring a change of direction. Maybe he wants that uncomfortableness to drive somebody to prayer. And yet we get in there and we rescue them. And God's like, what are you doing? I'm trying to to work in them. So we want to be careful because it's through the difficulties where I grow the most. You know that. That's where you grow. And God wants us to grow and to be mature and to be, to be whole in Christ. And it's found in Christ. I mean, we're complete in him, Colossians 2 says. And so in our trials, our fleshly life is cut away and our faith is exercised. So difficulty. We realize, man, I don't have what it takes. And people that want to help me are inadequate. So I turn and depend on the Lord, what he alone can supply. And that only happens through impossibilities. You know, Paul said that, didn't he? Second Corinthians. Um, I mean, this is a great godly man. Remember, he wrote half the New Testament. And he said, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about our affliction, what came to us in Asia. Listen to this that we were burned excessively beyond our strength. We despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that, here's why, we should no longer trust ourselves or not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. I mean, Paul went through adversity, affliction. He was burdened excessively. He was beyond strength. He despaired of life, even had a sentence of death. This affliction, it's like pressure. It's like trouble. The the burden was like too much to bear. He spent all of his strength and energy that humanly was available. He despaired that all hope was gone. He, He had a deep depression, internal sentence of death. It was despondent and it was extreme, total impossibility. This is the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was a faithful, fruitful, 
church planning leader, Bible scholar in the first century. But him, his team, they went through these crazy trials. And if he goes through them, we will too. And, you know, we don't know exactly what happened to him. We look at the book of Acts and we see trials that he went through. But some of that stuff is probably the Lord just says, you know, your mileage may vary, but, you know, but here you go. You're going to face all these things, you know, make your own application. And, um, and I think that we can apply them to our own lives. So when you serve God, you're walking in his will, you're serving him faithfully. You can just have trials that seem unnecessary. I don't need this right now. I'm already growing, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm walking with you, Lord. But he says this simple phrase in verse 9, in order that. You went through these things in order that. These three words, in order that this futile trial is not futile. It's apparently futile. It has a very valuable conclusion. In order that you should no longer trust in yourself. Look, you trust in yourself. Just look in the mirror and say, stop it. Because <laughs> you do, I do, we do. It's, it's the flesh of humanity. Unless you're a super saint, you trust yourself all too much. We need to die to self and trust in a God who raises the dead. And that is the purpose of trial. So a lot of times we're trusting in ourselves. God brings a trial that we learn, I ain't got what it takes. And so we got to learn more deeply not to trust in ourselves. I know I do. And that's why the Lord puts me in extreme situations to purge me of my self-dependence. So I'll more quickly and more fully put my trust in him and in him alone. It's like, I'll trust him, but I got plan B. I don't do that anymore. I've learned more and more day by day to put my trust in him. And it's, and then when I don't, I realize, okay, I'm trusting myself again, and that's why I'm going through a trial, because as I trust this God, my God, my Jesus, as I trust God the Father who raises the dead, he raises me out of a dead situation. And he'll raise me one day out of the grave, but that situation, man, I get encouraged because he delivers me regularly. Listen, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up here. But when you go through these trials, you got to remember that these temptations, these trials are common, but God will rescue you and he will grow you through it all. You can pass this on to those you love, but don't forget, hashtag self-counsel, walk in these things, Walk in them with me. Let's let's talk about it. If you don't mind, ask for prayer. Please pray for me. If I'm not on your prayer list, add me to your prayer list. I have some really exciting adventures ahead of me. I'm taking a big step of faith, a venture of faith. I want to see what God might do. And I'm excited about it, but I'm also apprehensive. And I really need your prayer. I think it'll be a blessing to all the people that uh, are involved with the biblical counseling ministry, with the church ministry, with all of those things. But just be praying that God will lead and guide and direct. Really, in Colossians, it says, I, I pray that I would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Just look at Colossians chapter 1. And pray that prayer that Paul prayed. Pray that for me. I don't ask for prayer a lot to my online podcast audience, but I am asking you to pray. And if you don't mind, say, I'm praying for you, Jeff, in the comments. If you're commenting for the first time, look at jeffchristensen.com. Go over to the top, and there is a place that says community. Click on the community button. Go to the latest podcast. There will be show notes. We call them show notes. I don't know. It's like a... It tells you what's in this podcast and then scroll, scroll all the way to the bottom and there's comments and there's a community of like-minded, born again, Bible-believing uh, students and Bible 
counselors that are there, and we edify each other, and we pray for each other. So go ahead and comment, hashtag self-counsel, pray for me, and uh, and then um, you know give me some feedback on these trials and what their purpose is. Love you guys. We'll talk to you next time. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. You can learn more at jeffchristensen.org. That's jeffchristensen.org. And be sure to share this podcast with a friend. Well, may the Lord richly bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.